All right, there's one way to more than triple your odds of long-term fitness and health success. In fact, the thing I'm about to say is probably the most reliable way that you can dramatically improve your odds of long-term success. Hire a good trainer or a good coach. And by the way, I say good because hiring a bad one isn't gonna help you. But if you find a good trainer or a good coach, you'll more than triple your odds of success. What does that look like? Well, for the average person, when somebody loses weight, they probably will succeed long-term by about five to 10% of the time. It's not good at all. With a good trainer or a good coach, you're looking at between 30 to 50%. Now that doesn't sound great, but it's phenomenal when you compare it to the alternative. So if you wanna go from almost 0% success to something like 30 to 50% success, hire yourself a good coach. There's nothing better. You know what's funny about that stat, by the way? Personal training and baseball, right? <laughs> Those are the two things where if you hit, you like bat for like, you bat 300, yeah, pretty if you, good. If you fail, <laughs> if you fail more than half the time, okay. you're still really you're good. You're still crushing, right? right? I see where you're getting this. Yeah, uh, if you're a stat, trainer yeah. and you get like 30% of your clients to have like, you know, long-term success as defined by they lose weight or they get fit and then they maintain it forever. Like it's mm -hmm. something they develop. It's a relationship that they keep going on for the rest of their life. Like you're killing it. You're yeah. really doing a great job. But I mean, still 30, you know, 30 to 50% still, you know. Yeah, I was hoping you weren't going to like, because uh, when we had this baseball uh, game that we we had did with our uh, personal trainers before, it was pretty depressing. Oh, like, no. I, I had a lot of expectations about how fit and athletic and, <laughs> you know, awesome it was going to be. And everybody just like completely sucked. Yeah, they don't have no yeah. skill. Yeah. <laughs> <They're all> <laughs> baseball, personal trainers, it's not a good mix. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, this is actually the, the stat that uh, – I think eventually made me uh, tired of personal training. Like yeah. I, I, I had a hard time with um, making peace with that. Like, and I don't think I didn't go into it knowing that stat. Like I didn't realize I, I thought that you, way more people had way more success mm -hmm. uh, with weight loss, especially if you had the formula, right? If I, if I knew what you needed to do macronutrient wise, program wise, things like that, that there'd be a much higher success rate. But even when you're really, really good, you're only clipping at 30% if you're lucky with your clients. And so 70% of the yeah. time you fail, that gets- They used to eat at me. It, no, it's, that's what, I mean, yeah. I really think that's what pushed me into management and uh, less, and I less, I liked training less because I got tired of that. I got tired of, of and there was much more success with coaching trainers teaching trainers how to build their business and be successful, yeah. even though there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, a high turnover rate, even on trainers, I felt I had more success helping them than I did with clients because, it, and now a lot of that you have, it, I think it's important to note that a lot of that has to do with adherence, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a, a large percentage of, of that 70% that fail more than half of them. It's purely because they don't even adhere to the advice. hundred percent. So absolutely. It's, yeah. Look at the stat of like somebody just coming to the gym without any kind of coaching and guidance. Oh, like, zero, zero know, to five percent. Like barely even there. So. Well, yeah. we, we used to have a, we used to have a stat at 24, um, that if he, if a person got a gym membership without a trainer, they fell off in the first three to seven months yep. on average. If they got five personal training sessions, that was it. Which is nothing. Yeah, which is nothing. Right? Five personal training sessions with a trainer, they were there. The that average person would stay longer than three plus years. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I mean, that's huge. That's yeah. huge return. Yeah. yeah, I mean, first off, this highlights just how hard it is, right? So because people listen, like, oh my god, that's wow. You're considering really good success rate, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, so half or less. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but that's because it's hard. The modern world and our lifestyle, just the default lifestyle, is designed to make you obese and unhealthy. You literally, literally have to be weird. You have to be on the fringe. You have to be not normal or not average in order to maintain a healthy body and a healthy, uh, you know, good fitness and good mobility for the rest of your life. You can't be like most people. And that's hard. Like, think of anything that is against modern society, against uh, what you would do on a regular basis. That means you have to develop behaviors and disciplines and structures that you're not going to get normally. You're not going to learn it at home growing up. You're not going to learn it in school. You're not going to learn it at work. It's just not going to happen. So that's why the su success rate is so low. All the, the, all the cards are stacked against you. Right. Now, that being said, it, this is just reality. This is just reality. Here's your two numbers. 
zero to five percent success versus maybe 30, 40 percent success. Okay. So obviously one's a lot better than the other. So your best bet is to hire a coach or trainer. And by the way, that 30 to 40 percent success rate, what's thrown into that are people that work with a trainer for two months or three months or whatever. People that work with a trainer for a year or two years consistently, I bet you that number is probably double that. So, because towards the end of my career, my success rate long term mm -hmm. with clients was pretty high. I would say probably closer to 70% of my clients develop really good behaviors. But these were people that work with me. The long term ones. Long term, right? Yeah. Long term. So, that's, that's what you have to understand and consider. But there's nothing more effective than hiring a good guide because this is a process. This is not a, you know, I, I thought the same thing, Adam, when I became a trainer, I thought, well, I'm just going to give people the answers mm -hmm. and they're going to follow it and that's going to work. Well, that's, that's like nothing. That's nothing. I thought success where I was getting people to lose weight and I got everybody to lose weight, but I, nobody kept it off. And that <laughs> yeah. same thing. I, I remember when I figured that out and I was like, wow, this sucks. Like I got to keep getting new clients and ones that fall off end up getting out of shape, like, like when does this stop? When I am I able to really fix this? I think right. that's the other part that was really hard as a, as a young trainer is people just, people hire you and they just want the answers. Mm -hmm. And so when you've- Because they don't know. They have no idea. Yeah, and, and I don't, they don't realize that, you know, even if I just give you the answers, um, you're, if I just give you the answers, you're more than likely going to fail down the road. And so, you know, you're in this service-based business and so, and, and you're trying to build your business and your book and you have these people that are hiring you and they're like, just tell me, just tell me what I need to eat. Just tell me what I need to Everybody do. Everybody says yeah, that. Everybody says that. And when you're young, it's kind of like, oh, fuck, you know, you know, we can tell this person like, no, it's not how this is going to work. Mm -hmm. Like later on, when you build confidence and you have the, <laughs> yeah. the track record, sure, that's easy to, to have that attitude. But when you first start out, it's really difficult to overcome that objection as a, as a trainer, you know, or how do I, how do I solve this, this problem that people are telling me what I need to give them in reality, if I just do that, even if we get to our goal, say in three or six months they're going to put it all back on yeah. after they leave. Yeah. Them. I mean, we're in the information age. A lot of this information is out there, you know, like to, to be able to research it and find like a good workout routine to find good nutrition, like uh, programs and things like that. But to, to go through the process and to get in that mental place where, you know, you're, you're going to be successful and you're going to do it long term and adhere to it. That's a whole nother. Conversation. It's also to understand what to expect and what the process feels like and looks like. Because that is, a lot of people don't understand that. Oh, you mean when I first start this weight loss journey, I'm not going to lose weight. I'm yeah. going to try and build. Yeah. Oh, you mean, you know, protein and calories, I have to increase them a little Flips bit in order to fuel head. that. Yeah. You mean workouts aren't going to feel like I'm dying. It's going to feel like, a, you know, I'm kind of like easy at first because I got to get my body. You mean I have to learn these skills of movement. I can't just go to the gym and beat myself up. Um, like, and what does that feel like? And what does this process look like? Oh, there's other signs to look for. Like maybe the scale's not moving down, but wow, my energy's better. My libido's better. Um, I have better movement. I didn't even know to pay attention to those things. This is what a guide, you know, helps uh, provide for you is helps you along that path. And then helps modify and teach you how to read your own body. But, you know, one of the challenges with this, and there's more resources now, but one of the challenges with this is trainers were never trained on this. When we learned how to become trainers, they teach you biomechanics, they teach you calories, proteins, fats, carbs, that's it. They don't teach you any of this other stuff. You have to learn through experience. You have to learn through five, at least five years of training people how this works, how this doesn't work, and what happens. And there was no courses at the time, there are now, but at the time there were no courses that taught you this. Mm -hmm. You had to kind of figure this out on your own. It was a lot of trial and error. And the ones that stuck around were the trainers that really cared about people and really were able to like, you know, crush their own egos and figure out that they were not doing a good job and all that stuff. Nowadays, thankfully, you have companies like NCI where, you know, the reason why that's the only certification course we officially work with is because that's what they focus on. No other course really does that right now. Like there's really no course that teaches you this entire process. All the other courses are still about the X's and O's and the connecting dots. That's part of the formula, but the other part of the formula I would argue is much more important. The application. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was- That's everything. I, it's really, I mean, I don't know of anybody else that's doing it like them. I mean, that was what was so attractive to their business was that it wasn't, it, not only were they on point, like a, let's, like a precision, precision nutrition is a popular 
nutrition certification in in our space. But again, it, it's it's very formal, just mm-hmm. like all the other national certifications, where it's like so it's very science heavy, very basic protocol heavy. It's not like application. It's not like, well, what do you do if they want to do this, yeah. and how do you how do you handle- communicate to them of this? Yes, yep. and so I think that's what NCI did such a good job was filling in that gap. I mean, a lot of that, I think of what a- attracts people to the podcast is is that is that we help kind of fill in a lot of those points because every there's, there's nothing on the podcast that we talk about that you can't chat GPT or Google search now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you can literally mm-hmm. find the information, but it's, it's the application process, the communicate, the communication that we have on the show that we talk about for an hour. So th- all the nuances, because mm-hmm. it's not black and white and NCI does a really good job of, I think, yeah. bridging that gap between your standard certification and then like how to really apply that to clients. Right. All right, today's giveaway, Maps Anabolic. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale this month. Maps Starter, the beginner resistance training program is 50% off. And then the starter bundle that includes Maps Anabolic and Maps Prime is also 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the rest of the show. All right, so I want to address the elephant in the room because I guarantee people watching us on camera right now are like, why is Sal and Adam so dark? Why has it got to be an elephant? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And why is, why is Justin red? Is it- <laughs> <laughs> what happened to everybody's skin? We got back from vacation. It was a good time. Uh, How'd you yeah. guys- this, is t- this is like tan. Dude. I love like, it. Like, yeah. like the red yeah. is tan for yeah. me. Okay, yeah. guys. Adam, Adam and I look like we're, we were on the beach. You just look like you're embarrassed. Like, <laughs> <laughs> your skin just gets red. Ooh, I'm flushed. Yeah. By the way, dude, you, yeah. uh, you got to use use the red light therapy for that really for sunburn okay yes it will make it will I'll do that to my back because uh so i i actually like was pretty happy with the fact that i didn't get like too crispy or anything mm. like i didn't <laughs> <laughs> there's levels you guys did you okay. lay out at all i mean did you actually lay out by a pool i know you guys did a lot of stuff did yeah you... so justin and i were and we really were in Kauai with out. our families yeah and that was a good time. You guys did all, I mean, your kids are old enough. You guys did a lot of adventure. Well, that's the thing. I just had to keep them busy. And honestly, it was, it's the best recipe because then their behavior and everything, they don't like just attack each other constantly. They're like, they were like totally like cool. And we had a great time with the kids uh, because we kept them busy, you know? And like we, we, we staggered it. So we do some days where we were chill and we we're doing the pool thing and all that. But like, we would definitely do the adventures and all that. Like, uh, you know, we, we kind of undulate it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I did get a lot of sun. Like I was out in the pool and I was, I was out there, um, you know, getting a lot of exposure, but, uh, was, was constantly kind of like uh, getting sunblock and all that. So <laughs> I had to, I had to make sure I didn't get too crazy. What did you guys, you guys did horseback riding? I saw did that horseback riding. We did this boat tour where it was, um, it was like on those inflatable boats, um, that, um, th- is that the one they canceled and they redid it? They canceled, redid, we did, we did it uh, a couple days later. Oh, okay. Uh, epic. It was, and it was good because it was like the best weather. We went further than we've ever been because we did it one time before, but this time we went all the way to the Nepali coast to the very end. Oh, and so wow. there was this one part where there's this cave tunnel. And, um, so we went through a couple that we've been through before. There's this one, I didn't know they had at the very end. And he just like decides to bomb it. And he, he's like going full speed into a cave. And I'm like, oh shit. And we we're all just like holding on for dear life. And he just knew exactly that, you know, the dimensions of it. So it was able to kind of like go in and like go through the other side clean and everything. We didn't hit anything, but I just, it was dark. He had no idea where That's we were cool. going. Like, I was just glad that he knew. <laughs> Like we had no idea. It was just like, he was just going full speed into this like cave. Like that was pretty sketch. I'm so glad I canceled yeah. mine. We're oh, you'd have loved it. No, <laughs> you would have loved it. it. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was like cabaning the whole time. I uh, did. Yeah. So you guys did those two, did you guys go hiking? Did you do Waimea or anything like that? Yeah, we did. We did a, a hike, which was like uh, this one. I actually preferred the one we did last time, but this one was like all out in the open. Um, and we went about halfway and realized that like, to be able to get back up, we're not going to be able to go all the Wait, way. Wait, which one was it? What's hike? It was it was Waimea, but it was like um, oh. a, it was a different it was a different hike. Uh, it was cool. It was fun. It was really that was a challenging hike. Yeah. It wasn't anything relaxing about. <laughs> I that. love I love Kauai. I love 
cool. It's like if you like outdoor shit and like jungles and hiking and stuff like that. That's where all the locals. The locals love that more than it's the most it's, island. It's the feel. least least touristy. You yeah, know, I love all the islands. Yeah, I, sure. we did. I've been to Waimea. So this obviously I have two little ones, so we don't do anything. We just go and we stay by the pool. yeah yeah the you pool and the beach all the, there. Yeah, I, I don't know if that'd be different day. if you didn't have kids or not. Huh? No, I did. <laughs> let's be let's be honest, dude. Let's Hold be on. <laughs> well, okay. Truth, hey, to be fair, when I went with Jessica and was just her nights when we first started dating, and I had the the you know. Well, your, she's adventurous, correct? Yes, and I'm in she, love at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah so exactly. Be awesome. Yeah, you try to get some. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So she's like, <laughs> so. Oh, she's I, like, I love yeah. that she yeah. pressed them on that though. Yeah. She like gets them out in the outdoors and yeah. everything. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can only tease so far because I'm 100 percent that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. just. I vacation for me is a pool and book and like i don't want to move i don't want to make any i want to make no plans like cassie my sister and her husband hopefully she doesn't get mad at me for bringing this up but they they got into a fight before we come in because tom is like extreme level of justin and courtney like they oh, go yeah, they hard it. they go hardcore adventure yeah. and they are detailed planned like before they go to vacation like day one this yeah, day two not then. only day one this day one we get up at nine o'clock we do this we we stop at this breakfast spot oh, at 10 30 wow. then we, we do this thing and then we catch lunch at two o'clock at this famous taco spot here like i mean he oh wow maps out and they're they're on the go always and you know we came we went up to Truckee for the week and uh, she lives nearby there right so they were, and she, we, I had a bunch of my family uh, that was up there. So, of course, my sister wanted to come over and see family. And uh, it was telling Tom, like, hey, I want to go over and, and visit Adam. He's like, okay, well, what's the plan? You know, it's, you know, it's my brother. You know, there's, there's no real plan like that. He's like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, what, what day are we going to go over there? Well, I, I don't know. One of the days we'll go over there. He's like, well, I got my mountain bike. And I got this going on. This thing. <laughs> and so I know like I'm the reason why they get into it because they'll, they'll call me and I'll be like, I don't, I have no plans. <laughs> I'm all ask me that morning how I feel. Like, I'll tell you what I got going on that day. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And I'm like, my attitude's this, like, Hey, if you stop by, that's great. If you don't, I understand if you're busy and stuff like that. But you know, this is what I, what it looks like when I'm on vacation. I so got, you guys must have been by the classic. pool or the or the lake. You yeah, we were at, we were at the lake almost either the lake or by um, the pool. You know, the pool at our, our Reno spot. Uh, yeah. The Max loves that. That's is it, so it was hot up there. Oh yeah, it got hot, but not the the back half. So the first half was, I mean, it was beautiful. The hot was 85. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That was the hottest day. Was 85, and we had two days of that. I also golfed all day, so I golfed on the hottest day. You know, we were out at the pool uh, a couple of days. We were on the lake a couple of days. So I was out. I was out in the sun, but chill. That's, Everything was. That's all, yeah. No, nice. we were we were uh, we were by the pool, the beach all day, and then um, my, so my son is my youngest, right? My Aurelius, he's like I am. So it took me four days to get him to really go into the pool because he's super cautious. Yeah. There's in fact at one point he had his life vest on, his hat, his little sandals, <laughs> and he stand. The kid pool is like literally this deep. It's only like yeah. I don't know, like twelve inches, and he's just standing with his feet and he's just looking around. I'm like, get in the water. No, you just looking at everybody. I'm like, all right, whatever, bro. <laughs> just stand right there. We'll get I, there's, a, I mean, Aurelius and Max are a lot alike in that in that sense. They both are very cautious. cautious yeah. I mean, Max is going to be four years old this week. And uh, he still like sometimes scoots his butt down the stairs. <laughs> it's just, just like, yeah. Outside, yeah, yeah. I love like, it. Like you just <laughs> now granted his mother also like, so I, it started like, you know, she was, she's always been really cautious with him going down the stairs. And, and then like when we started letting him go down the stairs by himself, she'd be like, scoot on your butt. Scoot on. So yeah. she's trained him to do that. And she's still to this day. I hear her do it sometimes when he's like, all right, mommy, I'm gonna go downstairs, get a banana. And she's like, all right, go down on your butt. I'm like, let the poor kid go down the stairs like normal. <laughs> He's going to be 16 scooting on the fucking stairs. You know what I'm saying? And his friends are going to be like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, my mom always told me to scoot on my butt on the stairs. So it's like, you gotta be careful how hard wire you are yeah. to wire this. You know what I'm saying? That's so funny. But, well, at one point, because uh, you know when, you go, when you're on vacation with little ones, it's, it's different. It's a different vacation. You're not, you're doing you know, what they want to do and it's busier and you got to pack. Bro, that's just life as a dad now. It's just it, right? Yeah, every part of your, your day is at, you no know, longer at, about at you. At one point though, I had this epiphany where I'm, we're trying to structure their fun. Do this, do that. Do this. And I, I, I'm like, you know what? He's going to just do, let me let them do what they want. And I'm just going to hang out with them. I don't know why I keep trying to tell them what to do. <laughs> so at one point, uh, I'm like, I did that. I figured that out. And what my son wanted to do is go play by the water fountain, play with the water. I'm like, all right, let's go do that. So we go over there. And then I made a mistake. And I made a total dad mistake. Mm. We were outside. So I thought, oh, I'm going to teach him how to spit water out of his mouth. 
Well, <laughs> what do you think he did the whole trip at every restaurant? <laughs> Were you with us when he did that? Yeah, yeah. We're at a restaurant, that. nice restaurant. Like it, yeah. My son just walks up to me. <laughs> all over his face. Oh, oh, face, dude. That's the best. Classic. Jessica looks at me all angry like, <laughs> oh, my God. Daddy taught me that. Yeah, like, oh. damn it. So now at home, that's what he's doing. He's oh, just spitting everywhere. Oh, my God. I'm like, no, buddy, you got to do it outside. He did it at, uh, at Jason's house yesterday. He did? Yeah, because the, he's got grass in the back. He's got the fake grass, though. Yeah. But he's just spitting out like food. I'm like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> He's like, why? It's outside. Like, so not really safe. I taught Max to piss outside, which I'm sure you went through this also. Yes. And so I've already had to like. That's all he him. wants to do now. Oh yeah. So we're like in yeah. public places. He's like, I'll just go <laughs> like pee on the tree. Dad. Areas. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look at all. <laughs> we do that at home when yeah. we're at our, when we're at, with, with there's or, people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We don't do it no. when we're at like public places. No, no, Dad. I'll just go pee right here. And I'm like, no, no, no. We don't want to do that. So That's hilarious. yeah, it's those things when you don't you don't really think all the way through. You're like, oh, this will be cool. I'll teach him that he can just go pee right here. You know. Yeah. Hop out of the jacuzzi, pee on the tree right there. There's nobody around. It's not a big deal. Right. And then they they register that as like, oh, I could just go to the restroom like this now. Anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, it doesn't. Fair it doesn't, game. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. Now you get, you know, son, let me t talk to you about Megan's Law list. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Dude, I have I have a story for you guys. I've been waiting to tell you uh, once we got together. Um, so we went up to Truckee with my my family that I've told you. You guys heard me tell the story. You guys know who Stephanie is. Yeah. She could, they, this was my like hardcore conservative side of my family. Like the all, they had five kids. They were all homeschooled. They all end up having four or five kids. Stephanie has five kids, homeschooled all of those mm -hmm. kids, grew up in church, very, very strict home. They grew up in very conservative and, you know, a bit, a bit naive to some things. And I was the, like the rebel bad cousin you know i'd come over and like they'd want to hear about like the latest you know hip-hop songs that were cussing and saying bad stuff or the latest slang terms or whatever like that and so and they'd sit around and I, so that was like how we grew up right so she's and she had and i absolutely love her and her family her kids are amazing and so she has this bit of night she's a little bit naive with some things right well, she's got the five kids. Her oldest, Rachel, is, I think she's at like, I don't know if it, this was at, when she was in high school or this was middle school uh, when she's, she's at a church camp. And my, my cousin, Stephanie, she had bought all the kids these big beach towels and she got them so each kid had their own. So it was like, you have the banana one, you have the palm tree one. So they all have like the, yeah. their, their patterns on them that are like, you know which one's yours so they don't fight over whose towel. Well, she, she does this, like, I don't know, a couple of weeks before they go to church camp, kid, Rachel goes off to church camp and it's like, I think the second day that they're there, she gets a phone call from like the, the major camp counselor there, whether, and they say, um, yeah, we we're calling about your daughter's towel. Oh, I got it. And she's I, like, let me guess. she's like, was it eggplant? She goes, <laughs> she goes, no, she goes, she goes, what, what's wrong with it? She goes, uh, the marijuana leaf. Oh, she didn't even know that that was a marijuana leaf. So she had to Google marijuana leaf and look it up. And she just thought it was like one of those Japanese who like plants. <laughs> She's like, is this a Canadian <laughs> towel? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I got a picture she of it. I got, I got a, a, I got a picture towel? of it, dude. It's a fucking like <laughs> all weed plants all over. Oh, now God. it's colored, right? It's like this purple and blue. It's all these, but it's, it is marijuana leaves wow. like crazy. And she oh, had no, no idea that it was dude. that. She sent her to church camp like that. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Oh my dude. god! Wow. Yeah, she had a. That's group. cute. I know it was like so yeah. endearing, right? Yeah. It's like she had no idea what a marijuana leaf looks like, or just a. I mean, and also in her defense, like she found a website. It's like bananas, palm trees. I mean, it's all. Yeah, it wasn't like it wasn't like on a like a stoner page where it's like <laughs> marijuana plants, bongs, sm up in smoke. You didn't have anything that said like lit or anything like that. It was just just all these trees and plants and and, and fruit and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> marijuana leaves. And so she sent her kid off to church camp with that. <laughs> that, that is so cute. Oh God. How old so is funny. it? How old is it? Uh, Rachel, so Rachel is in high school right now. And high school. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I saw all the kids there were like, oh She's my really God. into reggae. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I'll have to ask her what it was, because I know it happened in the last couple of years. I don't know if this was right before Rachel got into high school or she was in high school, but she's the, yeah, she looked like she was in high school in the picture that I saw. So it must have been more recent than, than I even think. So, yeah. I did, you, that, did you guys know the Declaration funny. of Independence was written on hemp? You ever know that? Hemp paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they used, they used to use hemp like crazy. Yeah. It was yeah. actually, 
they were major crops. William Hurst that like uh, paper put all the also clothes. It was really popular. Right? Yeah, no, Justin. You know, a lot of people don't know that William Hurst, right? Yeah, it was a newspaper, or he he he, he a big media newspaper publishing company. Yeah, and he wanted he was competing because he made was it paper that he made from wood pulp. Yeah, I think so. And he yeah. wanted to crush he hemp to, paper and stuff. So they he put out these newspapers propagandizing right. against uh, hemp. Yeah, and, uh, terrible propaganda yeah, ads. Yeah, yeah. and that was a first, some of the first laws well, against it, it. I was going to say, that's what, I mean, there's all kinds of laws against it, but uh, we, it's because it was super competitive, right? Mm. That was the reason why it got shut down, because you can make a ton of stuff with, with hemp. So you, much, yeah, yeah. Like, like I, I mean, even, wasn't it like rope and everything, too, and like all was kinds made of like, it. yeah, all kinds of like tapers, like, I forget like what other kind of materials, but there's like a ton of different things you can make. Yeah, with. actually, if you look at hemp um, and the ability to, for, uh, the, the the speed at which it grows um, and Better the than products cotton, for sure and the products that it, it, it can create it's actually a pretty damn versatile super durable uh, crop yeah, yeah super durable and great for the environment it's, you know grows really fast apparently easy to grow hemp we're talking about not necessarily marijuana but yeah pretty interesting that's why yeah and that was the first propaganda what it. was you know back to your guys's vacations I wanted to ask you like because you especially you you did so much what was your favorite thing that you did while you were out there. <sighs> Um, there was a couple things, but I think, um, I mean, the boat tour was great, but I think honestly it was like, because the North shore was open again, the last time I'd, I had gone, like, I think there was like a, a landslide, a mudslide that like prevented you from going up towards Princeville and all that up on that side. Um, and so we were able to do tunnels, this, um, beach that you can do snorkeling. And so we did that like twice. It was just so epic. Like you could oh. just... The kids were, it, it was actually really cool because we kind of sat back and were watching the kids as they went back in and they, like, they were just like, oh man, I see that. Like, you could just see their excitement as they're like seeing all the turtles and like all the stuff. Like they, they were everywhere. They're like, the fish were everywhere. It was oh, like cool. totally epic. Yeah, so we, we, that was cool. We didn't do a ton, but we did go to Poipu Beach and there's a section there where sea turtles come up. So I don't know what I, okay, I... I had a complete misunderstanding. So my uh, first of all, on the way there to Kauai, getting my kids excited, getting my son excited. I'm like, you're going to see fish. You're going to see turtle. He's like, turtle, turtle. So the whole time he's like, I want to see turtle. I want to see turtle. So we're like, okay, we got to go and see turtles. And so I asked people at the resort and they said, oh, poi poo, turtles come up. Now I thought it was like little turtles. I thought little turtles. <laughs> you were, did? Yeah, I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Brother, massive. massive. Yeah. yeah. Massive. So they all come up and we get there and they're already up on the beach, but they're not moving. And it's, he, my son can't, cause he knows turtles that look like this, right? Yeah. So he can't, I'm like, and you're there. It's obviously kind of roped off. So you can't get close to them. Yeah. yeah. And he's looking at them and I'm like, that's a turtle. And he can't, you can tell he's like, you know, it's a rock. I'm like, no, that's a turtle. And then they start moving their flippers and his eyes open up and he realizes this is a giant turtle. And he looks up and he goes, this is kind of scary. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so they can eat me. it's a little bit scary. I said, no, they're not going to get us. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I made the same mistake with Max last year when we went to Hawaii. Uh, we stayed at Turtle Bay. So, and that was my first time staying at Turtle Bay. And I just assume Turtle Bay. Gonna have turtles. Lots of turtles. Some turtles. Yeah. No turtles. So the whole time I'm like, we're going to Turtle Bay. We're You're like hyping it up. Yeah, I'm <laughs> hyping it up. We're going to swim with turtles. This Because I've been in Hawaii and actually swam with the turtles and seen massive turtles. And so I just assumed if we were going to Turtle Bay, there was going to be like more turtles than I've ever seen there. And so I was like hyping it up the whole trip to get there. To, so the whole trip, where's the turtles, daddy? Where's the turtles? I was like, fuck. No we, turtles. Yeah, no turtles. I'm like, we were driving all over the island <laughs> looking for turtles. <laughs> Do we? Yeah. But he threw a little tantrum yeah, yeah. at a luau. We did a luau, um, which there's this luau we go to every time we go to Kauai. Smith's family. It's been around for a long time, right? Yeah. And I was hyping it, telling about the fire guy, dancing with fire. Anyway, he's oh, the whole the time he's glued to it, right? Because they have the, they all, he likes fire stuff. So fire's coming, he's excited. It ends, right? It's over. It's like nine o'clock at night, 9.30 night. Do it again. I'm like, we can't, it's over, buddy. Boom, throws a full-blown tantrum there in the middle of the I'm like trying to walk with him. Like, I'm sorry, buddy. Oh, I want to see it again. I'm like, I wish I could do that for you, but I can't. Dude, Max was throwing a fit. Uh, we were the day we were leaving, and my buddy, my buddy's family and his kid was up there, which is his like best friend who's a, a year older than him, Hunter. And they're both into Mario Brothers. And they got all their like Mario Brothers to this and that. And they like they were playing. They were and they were great the whole week. And it's just when they're starting to leave. They were messing with each other, and uh, Max just starts getting all mad, and he's crying. And I, I come over, what's going on? What's wrong? He took my star. 
And I look at Hunter and I'm like, your star? What's what star? And then Katrina comes walking over. It's an imaginary star. I'm like, oh he, my. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he's throwing a fit because Hunter goes, I took your star. <laughs> it's not even real. It's not even a tangible thing. And he's throwing a fit because he's like, and he's like crying. He won't give me my star back. And I'm like, Daddy takes it right from him. Here you yeah, go. There you go. <laughs> Pretend. Yeah. He was, like, he was say, so give, satisfied. He was a new <laughs> one. Yeah. He was so satisfied. I'll give you a power up. Yeah. Too. Well, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I cannot believe he was throwing a fit over Hunter stealing his imaginary, imaginary his imaginary star. <laughs> and the the yeah. solution to it was He's Daddy. Daddy suit. took it back. Yeah. And Hunter was like, "No, you didn't." I said, "Yes, I did." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And I did too. Yeah. 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 Tells his dad. You guys start fighting over yeah. the imaginary star. <laughs> imaginary star dude. kids are so dude. funny. Dude. I love oh, that's it. That's funny. We were watching fireworks, uh, you know, for the fourth. And, uh, you, you know, I, I, I explained to him how loud they were going to be. But, you know, when you don't see fireworks ever in front of you. So he's watching them all excited. And they start getting loud. I can look at, I'm looking at his face. And I can tell little by little he's getting scared. After about three or four of them, he's like, uh, can we do some that aren't so loud? I'm like, these are fireworks, buddy. <laughs> we're, They're all loud. We're committed. We had to go inside. Couldn't finish the show. I was like, ah. <laughs> and Adam bought like, he bought, so he bought a yeah, box. Yeah, I saw he had this huge uh, array of like big old hey, yeah, It said on the bottom. Huh? I know why Adam got this yeah, one. It's yeah. the same reason why I would have got it. On the bottom it said, Whisker D's, Whisker Don'ts, <laughs> Joe Dirt, where he <laughs> has all those like. No, it's, it says on the bottom, it says the most powder allowed maximum, by law. Maximum, <laughs> yeah, maximum legal power. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, hell yeah. It's so how I picked it. America. I, I bought it when we were we were heading back from Truckee and uh, we stopped and so I wasn't even planning on doing this. Like I, uh, I stopped there on that. Cause I knew in San Jose, I knew that it's illegal, right? Fireworks were illegal over here. And so I, I pull, I pull up, we go to the bathroom and there's a bunch of fireworks stands there. And so I'm like killing time. Why Katrina's in inside with Max and I, and I see, uh, all the fireworks. I'm like, Oh man, I'm looking at them. And I see this, like the biggest box of like, and I'm like, those look badass. I'm like, I'm going to buy them. I'm going to buy those. And worst case scenario, if I can't light them, I'll light them somewhere someday or whatever. Right? So yeah. I literally asked for what's what are the biggest, baddest ones you have. And they were this, and only, there was only seven fireworks in there, but each one of but them they were, were like this big. Dude. Yeah. Each one was like a grand finale like type the of legit ones. They were legit. They actually, those are the best firework, legal fireworks that I've ever bought yeah. before. It put on Sweet. a really, yeah, we definitely had the best fireworks. They're not like the illegal ones we had when we were kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah we All we bombs. had was like snakes and like stupid you shit. You ever like shoot that. off M80s and stuff? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not around like adults. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. no. We would, yeah. It was, yeah, that was all underground. That's all, yeah, all yeah, very yeah. dangerous stuff. Lots that's of right. black cats and cherry bombs. And yeah, yeah I was I was that kid yeah. for sure. Hey, did you guys, uh, so Brett Contreras did a big post. Did you guys see the study? Oh, of course. Hip thrust versus oh, squats. Of course, Okay, dude. so I was quick to be on that thing, dude. I know. Okay, so here's the deal. If you listen to Mind Pump, you would already know. We 100, it literally confirmed everything that we said about squats wow. versus hip. The whole debate, which one's better for your butt, blah, blah, blah. We're always saying, look, squats are probably generally better uh, because they develop everything. It's more functional. Study comes back. Better signal. They both build the butt pretty similarly. Squats build everything else more than hip thrust. Now, here's why, and I want to address this because there's definitely people listening right now who are saying, my butt didn't build with squats. They only built with hip thrusts. Okay, here's why. If you are unable to properly connect and fire your glutes with a squat, a hip thrust is better for you. Yeah. Because it's a glute, essentially. It's it not really an isolation. Yeah. But it makes you squeeze the glutes and it helps you feel them. I would do hip thrusts with clients that were just quad dominant when they did their squats. But everybody else, generally speaking, squats are superior. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm glad they did that. Yeah, study. I mean, the, the truth is, if you're trying to build your butt, it's an incredible, you can't, you would never want to not do one of them. Yeah, you do both. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're trying to build your butt. Now, if you're not somebody who cares about building your butt that much and you just want overall balance, right? like that's why I don't hip thrust that much. Yeah. It's not like a big, yeah. it's not a big focus of mine to be build my butt. You already yeah. have a nice butt. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it just, that's how good squats are though. Yeah, I mean, right. that's, that's the point is that it's not that hip thrusts aren't incredible and don't have tremendous value. It's just that squats are incredible for that. And it hits all of that and some, and mm -hmm. we've been saying well, this since day one. So in this study, cause I know like in the past, they weighed heavily on, uh, like the muscle, activation yeah, like the e, the, yeah the e stem e the, stem stuff yeah. like so yeah so was that that wasn't like a, a huge part of this study. no this was literally a study that looked at hypertrophy yeah. so here's the thing when you look at studies on 
you know, uh, what, you know, EM, I think it's EMG EMGs, or yeah. what MRI or activation, all that stuff. That doesn't tell you the whole story. Cause at the end of the day, who cares? It's about how much muscle you built and, or right. how well you perform. That's it. That's just it. The end line. result. It doesn't matter. So a hip thrust, you'll squeeze your glutes <clears throat> at the top, but it doesn't load the glutes like a barbell squat, especially in a stretch position, for example. So when you compare them head to head, the glute gains are almost identical. The squats are superior with everything else. So if you want to pick one exercise for your lower body, make it barbell squats. Again, if you can't connect to your glutes, hip thrusts are great or do them both. This is like one of those, like, you know, they have to, which one do you pick? Why don't you just do them both? Now for performance, for athletic obvious. performance, you just can't. I mean, come on, barbell squats all day long. Mm -hmm. A hip thrust can't compete with a barbell squat for just overall uh, athletic performance. Well, I mean, period. I just don't think that it, I don't think it competes with it. I think no. it's it's a I think hip thrusts are a great exercise as a a secondary movement for somebody who's trying to build their glutes. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, if the, and, and that person really, it needs to be, that needs to be the primary focus for mm -hmm. it to be a major thing to be in your routine. Otherwise, if you're hip thrusting more than you're squatting, you're missing out. Yep. I mean, squatting is, is, is superior for all those reasons that there's, you're getting more value than just glute activation. Right. And a good way, a, a good way to combine them is like that. There's two ways to combine squats and hip thrusts. If you have no trouble connecting to your glutes with squats, so you're not super quad dominant then do squats first and then do hip thrusts second. If you have trouble connecting your glutes, your quad dominant, do hip thrusts first, squat second. Now it's not because you pre-fatigue the glutes and all that. It's literally, if you do a hip thrust first, if you have a trouble connecting to your glutes when you squat, hip thrust allows you to feel the glutes and then that should contribute to form that contributes to more glute activation. That's really all it is, the feel thing. So squats before hip thrusts for most people, Hip thrust before squats if you're quad dominant and you have trouble feeling your glutes. I do want to point out that, I mean, this is another, or highlights another reason why I love Brett Contreras. I think uh, the way he presented that mm. um, with leading with, you know, I was wrong. This is what I, I believe this yeah. to be true. Here's what the research said. Um, to come forward like that, I think, and and to present. He has integrity. Yeah. yeah. Hey, by the way, do you know why he was, you know why he's wrong? Not he, Because there was a self-selection bias with the clients that he got. He became known as the butt building person. So the kind of clients that started coming to him yes. were people that had challenges firing their glutes right. and building them with traditional exercises. Issues. Yeah. So he would get these people who were more quad dominant or whatever, and he would do hip thrusts and lo and behold, their butts would grow. So in his experience, hip thrusts were superior, yep. but that's because he had a self-selection bias of people that came to see him. Yeah. Really Be good point. Ex right. Really but now if you point. took the, like we did, not all of us train just everyday people. We didn't have, I wasn't known as the butt building guy. I was just a personal trainer that at one point became known for being a good personal trainer. So all of the clients that came to me were just everyday people. I didn't have people specifically picking me because, oh, I can't build my butt doing squats and deadlifts. That's the guy that does that. So that's yeah. why he had that opinion. I mean, Justin was known as the ass man, but yeah. not for those reasons. Not for those yeah. reasons. Yeah. Those, oh, Just on the license internet. plate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the license, license plate. Did you guys ass know man. that there's a, uh, I think this is true. There's a proctologist and that's, that was his, uh, that was his, uh, his license plate. Ass man. Seems what's a little that, Wasn't that a joke? On, it was was that a joke? It's, it's in a movie. Episode. It's in a movie. It's in um, uh, Kill Bill. No, uh, is it? No, 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 no. dude. No, that's, that's a, a different. That's fuck wagon or something. Uh, <laughs> <wagon. laughs> yeah, no, I ass man. I think was in the one. I think with it's Vince Seinfeld, Va dude. Vince Vaughn, and it's the one where he gets out with the bat, and he's kind of he acts all kind of gangster. What's he called? I Damn, it's been, Andrew, you should know this one. Uh, you don't. It was on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. Seinfeld. Yeah. No, oh, it maybe it's on maybe. Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah. So it's okay. So maybe I saw it. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you say, yeah. <laughs> I say it because I've seen that. I've seen that too before, and I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. So it was either that or that uh, the Vince Vaughn one, or both. That yeah. I've seen. That Did on. you guys see? I was like uh, looking at, at uh, Instagram my way back uh, from Hawaii, and I saw that. Um, oh, what's his name? I was gonna say BJ Penn. It's not BJ Penn. It's. Um, uh, Oh my God! Why am I forgetting his name? He's the 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 one that did all. Jake? No, he's up up from Canada. Um, George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre. God, why did I forget yeah, his it's name? It's easy to confuse BJ Penn and George. <laughs> <laughs> they look alike. They're the yeah. same. <laughs> um, yeah. No, but so so he did a post and he had uh, Elon Musk training 
Oh, okay. With so is him? Is, is this really happening, or is this just a bunch it's, of bullshit? I think it's happening. No, it's not. Th Dana White came out and said that he might. I've be heard all him. kinds of crazy stuff. I've heard. You think it's just bullshit? I do. I've like. So first off, okay, uh, Zuckerberg's been training jujitsu for a while now. Um, Elon not. So Zuck, in my opinion, has a. But here's the deal: Why are you going to do this, Elon? You're going to take your time away from building billion dollar companies, solving the world's problems, so you could fight. You know, I don't know, way. man. I feel like well, okay. I guess they conquer time. so many things. It's almost like it's just another thing yeah. for him to kind of okay flex. You, you also have to understand that part of why Zuckerberg and Elon Musk especially they're so competitive, dude. Well, no, that what in today's time, um, like part of being a really really successful CEO entrepreneur is that you you are. You're you're out there uh, promoting yourself, yeah. And Elon Musk is one of the greatest at promoting himself. Is. This is another way to promote yourself, which in turn then helps all your businesses. So don't think of it as like, oh, this is taking away from his companies. Like, no, this is self promotion. Well, here's the truth. Yeah. Okay. Here's the other side of it. Okay. Uh, these are billionaires. It's like a small club of yeah. people. Yeah. And let's be honest. If we were all billionaires. Like we would fuck with each other all hundred percent, yeah, with shit like 100%. that. Yeah, I don't know. It's, so it's kind of it funny. Perfect sense. It's yeah. kind because of, he was in it, like the, the Mars race or whatever with what's his name, and you know. So I mean, that makes as a person, I kind of feel like Elon's kind of hilarious. Like if I sat down with him, I'd be like, oh man. Yeah. So I mean, Zuckerberg, like he went through that whole process of like uh, going through the tournaments with BJJ, right? Yeah. And so he was like, I'm, I'm sure he's like feeling confident yeah. with that. But the, so Elon's like, let's do a cage match. Right? Right, <laughs> <laughs> just to up the stakes a little bit. Yeah, I, I think this is just all self promotion. I really so. do. Yeah, yeah. I think that the, these guys have ma listen. There is a ton. But he's bigger than him. Too. There is he's a, a ton bigger. of genius CEOs that are incredible that we don't even know the names of yeah. because they're old school. They don't quiet. self promote. Yeah. They're quiet. Yeah. They crush it business. They go on to the next company, crush another company, and and nobody knows who they are. Yeah. Nobody knows because they're great at executing. The, what makes these guys so great is not only are they great at executing and building businesses, but they're also great at self-promoting. And mm. to me, this is just another way to self-promote. I think yeah. that's what this is. I would. Who would you want to win if you watch them? Fight? Elon, of course. Yeah, Elon. Come on, Elon. I'm I'm not a Zuck Zuck fan. Zuck. Zuck's <laughs> an alien, dude. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think he's human. That's the reason why I don't want it to happen. I don't want to see Elon get beat. You don't want to see him get beat. I yeah. want to win. So. He outweighs Zuck, but Zuck's been training for a while. Zuck's got some yeah skill, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, but cage match means you can throw punches and stuff too. So yeah, maybe that's, but maybe yeah, that's, uh, he just closes the distance, takes him down. He'll beat him. Um, is he a, a purple belt or higher? I doesn't. I think he's been training. For, look, if you've been doing jujitsu for two years. You'll submit most people if you hit the ground, just because really? it's it's yeah, fun. because it's 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 like swimming. You have to learn it. So you hit the ground, you don't know what you're doing. You move the wrong way, the guy's gonna choke I feel you. Like you're biased because that's what you did. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that gives me experience. I don't know. That. I mean, I've never seen like Elon move. You know what I mean? I don't know how well he moves. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> how about Zuck? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I haven't <laughs> so, actually watched see, the him footage of that either. Be really, really weird. You know? Oh. Didn't he like uh, redo the match so he could win? Is that true? I, the, I feel like there yes. Was, there no, was, I brought that up. Yeah, there's an article. Yeah, about I brought that. that up. No, he did. So like, there was like, did he argue with the ref or whatever? Yeah, and they made yeah. him re they redid it. Yeah. So like he, oh, so, that's bullshit. Yeah, he supposedly originally lost, and then they he had him recount the something. I don't remember what he complained about. Like that wasn't fair, and then they redid the match because he's Zuckerberg. Oh, <laughs> you know what I'm it's like the billionaire I'm Zuck. Yeah, yeah. 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 hilarious. <laughs> anyway, I got a, I got a I got a great study on strength training that somebody sent me. So, um, you know, when, I, when, when we came out with the resistance training revolution, the idea was to, to come out before things started getting mainstream with strength training because we saw the writing on the wall. Studies were coming out mm -hmm. confirming what we had known about strength training, which at the time for most of, the, you know, I guess for the last maybe few decades is kind of a stigmatized form of exercise. Nobody really considered it to be a longevity form of exercise or one that was for Fat, it was just bodybuilders, and that's pretty much it. And maybe athletic performance, and that's it. But we knew when you stacked the chips and did the math, if you had to compete forms of exercise, strength training is just superior for longevity, for health, for fat loss, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the data is starting to come out to really support it. Well, another study comes out. You ready for this? They compared, this is my favorite study so far for strength training. They compared different forms of exercise for depression. Mm. Strength training was superior. Well, that's oh, a cool wow. study. It was superior to other forms of exercise for depression. The thought process was before, 
Well, just moving will make you fe feel better and just getting healthier will make you feel better. So really the form of exercise doesn't matter. Um, but although there's truth in that, there's also truth and they're, they're not all equal. And in this study, strength training uh, showed to be better. What are, did, do, you, uh, do you recall what all the modalities were? Was there like yoga, running? I'll, I'll, um, let me pull it up. But I know it was cardio versus strength training. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Okay, now the, let's speculate. Like what's, what, what is your reason to – obviously we know it for, you know, muscle and metabolism and all the obvious things, right? Mm -hmm. Bone. Like we know, we know that it's superior. That's why we've always touted it anyways. But for depression, that's interesting that let's say a really good yoga class doesn't even it doesn't compete with resistance training mm. or you know a good leisurely run doesn't compete. So what I is gotcha. it? Okay, let's hear okay. It. So so well, I'll tell you my theory, but let me tell you what the study says. So first off, they looked at fifty eight studies. So this was a big analysis; it wasn't just one study. So they looked at a lot of studies. Fifty eight, um, ten countries, almost five thousand participants. Okay, so this is like legit. Yeah. They found that for depressed, depressed youth, exercise, so just general exercise, is significantly better than usual care for reducing anxiety alone. So compared to the typical treatments, any exercise is better than the typical treatments. Um, exercise is better for depression across the board from us for usual care. In depression specifically, resistance training outperformed aerobic exercise mixed exercise and mind body exercise mind body being things like yoga, yoga yeah. stuff like that right so resistance training against mind body <clears throat> against cardio superior for depression wow now yeah, let's, uh, here, let's here's hear what your I speculation think. here's what i think i think uh okay health benefits are going to make you feel better no matter what all mm -hmm. of them will you improve think your inflammation health. in the brain yeah. i think insulin sensitivity because strength building muscle yeah. is the best for that for yeah. sure but i think it also has to do with the fact that when you do strength training um, although all forms of exercise, you have kind of these objective, uh, measurable progress, strength training, you struggle, you challenge yourself, you get stronger, you add weight, you get stronger. It's so objective. It's so yeah. clear that I'm doing 50 pounds more now than in before. Confidence I mean, and it building. was hard and I have to push. I mean, just play grind. devil's advocate though here. Like, I mean, you could do that with running. You know, the first time you could only run one mile and then the next time you went out there, you could get a mile and a half and then, then your your mile and a half time was down by 30 seconds. So there's ways to to do that. There is, but let's say you take the average person. You like who, euphoric sort of rewards to. You yeah, could, you get that yes, also right? with running, so, right? Let's, so, let's say I'm, you take the, let's say you take, because this is done on youth, right? You say you take youth and you say you take someone who does a mile in uh, 13 minutes or just whatever. They can't run a mile, right? And you get them to go from 13 to seven minutes. Okay, that's a huge improvement. Seven minute miles healthy for the average kid. How is that going to feel in their everyday life? Now, take a kid who couldn't do a pull up, couldn't do a push up, couldn't do a squat. Now they're doing five pull ups, they're doing 25 push ups. So, what you're saying is the, the everyday life, real, the real world confidence in terms of the translation. Over. Totally. Yeah. The real world confidence Because strength carry carries over, over to yeah, everything, it carries over to a lot more. And you feel it. Whereas then, stamina, then cardio, I'm not going to test yeah. uh, quite often. Whereas strength, like I'm getting up, I'm standing. I'm moving over here. I'm bending over. You know, I just feel your, my posture seems different. The other thing would be hmm. the hormone changes. We know strength training uh, raises testosterone. Right. It balances hormones. Other forms of Regulates. exercise. Yeah. It's kind of mixed. The insulin. And so this is all speculation that I'm saying right now because they don't know why. But this study does show strength training is superior for depression. So if you're, a, if you're a, at least in this study or in this analysis, if you're a kid, if you're youth, right? So adolescent, teen. Um, and you, you're depressed and you're looking at what form of exercise is going to help uh, and you want to pick one because you're probably not going to do five or three, do strength training. That's the mm. one that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. Yeah, now my recommendation, if that was um, somebody who's specifically trying to get into strength training to combat depression or anxiety, I, I would start with like a MAPS 15 type of protocol, right? Where, I, I love that. Yeah. Because like, it's every day. It's a little bit. Yeah. Very doable. Versus yes. trying to do something more intense, mm -hmm. um, more consistently. I think just building a habit and a routine of, you know, lifting one or two exercises every day mm -hmm. and, and, and then building on that as you go. I think that would probably be, if I was a, a doctor who was prescribing it to somebody for that reason, I think that's how I'd probably prescribe it. Here's the other part I even think of. Uh, you take a bunch of, I don't know, 15 year olds and you have them do, this group does cardio, this group does yoga, this group does strength training for six months. 
whose body is going to look significantly di- different at the end of it. I have another one. That's for you. also going to contribute. I have, an, I have right? another one for you. Yeah. Too. How about testosterone? Yeah, that, that's I testosterone that, yeah. is a feel good mm-hmm. hormone confidence builder, mm-hmm. and so if you're depressed fat, lazy, not moving around, stuff like that, and your testosterone levels are low. Mm-hmm. And you can go for a run all this day is long. And women, by the way. You can you could mm-hmm. run like crazy and do yoga like crazy and you're not going to see the increase in testosterone like you will from squatting two mm-hmm. or three days a week. Mm-hmm. So that there's probably a good reason why it, it does. The uh, other thing too is that if you're depressed and anxious, one of the characteristics, not always right, but one of the characteristics is you, you might be in your head quite a bit and you're just thinking and, and, and mulling things over and spinning, right. you can run, you can walk, you can even do yoga and still stay in your head, but go lift weights properly while you maybe in between sets, but while you're doing your set, you ain't, you have to think of what you're doing. You yeah. can't think of, it's not like I can go on a run and just think about my problems. If I'm lifting, I gotta like I gotta move the weight. I have to be in control. Due to I'm the doing. complexity of the skill. Yeah. The skill, the yeah. weight, like you're gonna hurt yourself. No, that's a good point. That's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, what a, I find. Yeah, the repetitive movement, you can still be milling over a lot of these ideas and things that you're wrestling with. Uh, you know, as you're running. Sometimes people look at that as its own kind of form of therapy. Yes. Like, but like to your point, like you, you can't even consider that when you're when you're lifting weights because you have to be in the moment of actually lifting yeah. the weights and doing the uh, movement i'd yeah. love to see it compared to something like jiu-jitsu like it would be really interesting to see because oh you, i mean jiu-jitsu would be great because you get, just said because you have to be present with that's that right too. you yeah. have to be all super present it's a skill you get it's a skill yeah. you build strength increase testosterone. you're also rolling with companions and other people so oh, there's yeah. so there's a community aspect wow, to that it that would be huge oh, that's right so touch, it'd be really yeah. interesting to see yep touch it, and and yes. working with other people yes. that's a whole different right? stimulus yeah you're a 100% present you cannot even for you think lifting or squatting you have to be present you, i mean you can you can't relax <laughs> you put when, to sleep if you think that's right that. right yeah. so talk about even yeah. more present and then you also that's and, a great example and then you also yeah. get the community aspect mm-hmm. of rolling with other people and so it'd be really interesting to see that that compared i bet that would be a really i good, bet it would crush actually yeah i mean perfect world you you compare you do that with some straight sure. strength training but i mean in terms of like traditional forms of exercise obviously strength training i mean i just love yeah. i mean i really i hope that we see this in our future it's really unfortunate because of how much uh big pharma uh you know has controls the narrative uh, because it would be it would be amazing to see us reduce the amount of prescribed medication for things like anxiety and depression and more things like this. Like, hey, you know, how about you go strength train, you know, for 15 minutes a day and right. practice a new mm-hmm. form of sport or art or something like that. And and the results would probably be. Yeah, it's weird that it's like an alternative means, right? Instead yeah. of that being the standard right. and you don't get that standard, then you go to get prescription. Right. Yep. yep. Right. I foresee a future. Well, not foresee. I would love to see a future where these clinics where people get treated for things like depression, and anxiety, include really well-trained um, trainers and coaches that are a part Absolutely. of the, that are part of the whole protocol. Like you show up and this is a part of it, which would also include body work. Cause I think that's also, that would contribute significantly. Obviously talk therapy, working exercise, proper exercise, diet. And then you could have pharmaceuticals there as a backup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if they don't, you, it, it, isn't this enough for people to, to realize that, you know, big pharma doesn't really care about truly helping you. Like it, it's promoted. It's really about keeping you in the loop or in the cycle. They care about helping you with the tools that they have and the ways that they can make money. So it's not that they don't care about helping you, although I'm sure some of them don't. It's that here's what we have to help you with. So we're going to figure it out with this. Yeah. Not necessarily what's best because the best thing to do would be to do it in these other ways. It's rather we have a drug for that and that's what we do. So here you go. Yeah. All right, so let's let's give uh, Dr. Jolene Brighton a shout out. Love yeah. her. Oh, excited! She's yeah, coming she's back in studio. So amazing uh, doctor. Um, she she's known for her book. I think it's Beyond the Pill, right? Yep. About mm-hmm. the the, mm-hmm. the side effects and issues with birth control, how to come off, and all that stuff. If you're a woman, uh, she's a great follow. Yeah. Hey, check this out. Uh, if you want to know if your hormones are in the right places, if testosterone is optimized, if you have good balance of estrogen and progesterone. You can get blood tested at mphormones.com. They can prescribe testosterone. They can also work with peptides to help your body burn more body fat, optimize your longevity and your health. By the way, they also carry the GLP-1 agonist peptides like semaglutide, brand name known as Ozempic, and others. So if you're looking into peptides, 
Go to mphormones.com. There's doctors there. They work with prescriptions. This is not some shady gray market, uh, you know, research lab. This is legit stuff from real pharmacies. Again, go check them out. Go to mphormones.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First caller is Norm from California. Norm, what's happening? How can we help you? What's going on, guys? I just want to thank you guys for everything you've done. Uh, I found you guys very late in life. Um, very unfortunate for me. Uh, people have always been saying during the pandemic, oh, listen to this podcast, this podcast. Nothing resonated until I found you guys. Um, I actually found you guys from a YouTube I was like, who are these thick neck dudes just talking about things I want to talk about? <laughs> um, so I unfortunately found you guys on in February. Uh, I immediately bought Maps Aesthetic and Maps Anabolic Pro because I'm kind of a sucker for a deal. Uh, but since I'm right. a sucker, I didn't start either of them. Hmm. Um, so my main problem is I'm a chronic overtrainer. I kind of lost myself in this like whole fitness journey. And a lot of the things you guys talk about really resonate. Like, for example, I think Adam, one time you were talking about like the misconception that we have to destroy a body part, uh, eat and then recover and do it over, do it over again, kind of lived for the pump. Um, and with age, uh, I'm realizing that's not the best way to maintain gains. Uh, I've heard you guys talk about what's optimal versus what someone can tolerate. And finding a balance between like the intensity, frequency, and volume. Uh, currently, I'm doing an eight by eight program. Uh, I'm not sure if any of y'all have ever done that one, but it's uh, pretty high volume. Um, and you know, just like anything that is novel, the first few weeks you feel it, you get sore, you you love it. Um, but the problem with me is like I'll have a great workout, and the next day I'm eager to get back into the gym. But uh, I probably should be taking the day off. So I go into the gym. I'm like, oh, I can't really feel the pump. I call it a wash. And then I end up doing cardio. And like I deplete myself. Um, so it's like difficult for me to have an active rest day. So my two, I have basically two questions. Um, do you guys have any guidance on recognizing signs of overtraining and striking the right balance between pushing myself and getting recovery? Um, and what's your perspective on 8 by 8 training and how it compares to any of your programs? Uh, when I was trying to figure out which program is probably best rather than just buying whatever the deal is for the month, I was looking at anabolic symmetry or, or even bands because I have some, uh, right and left imbalances. Uh, but I just wanted to hear your take. Yeah. Norm, the best, first off, let me ask you a few questions. Cause I'll help me answer. Yeah, let's get to How long goal. have you been, uh, training consistently for, uh, man, like. 16 years, uh, okay. since I was 17. Okay, and you know what? You, how, how many days a week are you in the gym? Five, six? Five, uh, but honestly, like two of them are like, I would say four of them are solid, but okay. one of them is just like me going in and then I'm ending up doing a lot of cardio okay. because I'm trying to burn calories. All right, diet-wise, are you hitting protein targets? And, and then also, how is your sleep? Uh, protein targets, yes. Uh, sleep is anywhere between six to eight hours. Uh, I'm averaging seven, so I would say it's pretty solid. Okay. All right. So this is going to be pretty easy. What's the goal? You want to, I'm assuming you want to build muscle. Is that the goal? Build muscle and be aesthetically, um, be more aesthetic. Okay. All right. So this is going to be, the answer is going to be easy, uh, that I'm going to recommend to you. Uh, the hard part is going to be for you to start to identify what it feels like to not overtrain. So I could give you the signs of overtraining, but mm -hmm. what's going to end up happening is you're going to keep you're going to keep going to overtraining. You're going to notice the signs, try and back off. Then you're going to overtrain, back off. So what you need to do initially is follow a well-written program. I'm going to give you MAPS Anabolic. That's the perfect program for you. Follow okay. that and then get used to what it feels like to not overtrain. Okay? So rather than trying to pay attention to the signs of overtraining, try to get used to what it feels like to not overtrain. That's going to give you a nice um, like starting point. Okay. Maps anabolic is going to be ideal for someone like you do the, do the three day a week version. You're in the gym three days a week. And if you're getting stronger consistently, you're doing, you're doing fine. And that's probably what's going to happen. What's probably going to happen is you're going to follow maps anabolic and you're going to get stronger on a very consistent basis. Now, after that, then you can follow one of our other programs, but use the, how you felt during maps anabolic as your guide. Anything above and beyond that means you're doing too much because there's a lot of room between doing too much and overtraining. In other words, there's the perfect amount that's going to give you the best results. More than that, you get worse, worse results, but you're not necessarily overtraining. You're just doing more than you need. 
and you're taking away your body's ability to adapt, but you're still not overtraining. But if you keep pushing that, eventually you get to overtraining. We don't want to just not, we don't want to just avoid overtraining. We want to stay in that sweet spot. And the best way to do that is to train in a particular way that is likely to put you in that sweet spot and get used to that feeling. So I would say follow MAPS Anabolic. That's probably the, the perfect program for someone like you. This is a really, it is a really easy answer. It's challenging mentally for most mm -hmm. people that have to go through this training, as all of us have experienced this ourselves, right? So there was a, a period of time where I finally realized like, oh, wow, I'm not only overtraining, but I'm nowhere near what optimal is for me. And then when you hit that sweet spot the, the for, for the first time, it feels like you should be doing more. And that's the, the mental challenge because if yeah. you are going to follow MAPS Anabolic, like we're telling you to, you're going to be in weeks you know two and three going like, fuck, I don't know. It's just I'm not seeing enough yeah. yet. Or I it think it feel like enough. Yeah, I feel like I could do so much more. And then you're going to then you're going to, oh, I'll just do a little bit of this. Or I'll just So the goal right here or the if you were a client of mine, my goal for you would be let's focus on building muscle, following this program to a T, and then after that, I'm going to get you shredded. Mm -hmm. So, and that's only going to make the getting shredded part easier if you trust the process. You trust me as a coach, and I say, listen, eat at a maintenance or in a surplus, not a crazy surplus, maintenance or surplus on most days, and follow the program to a T. When we get out of there, you're going to be stronger. You're going to have built significant muscle, and then I'm going to get you shredded. So you will have a faster metabolism. So then we get go to get lean on the next program, which you you are on the right track. I think symmetry would be a great choice for program two to follow up. Yeah, and I mean recovery is your utmost priority right now. So like even you've established the fact that you're disciplined enough to go to the gym multiple times throughout the week. So like that five day a week schedule, you can maintain with this program. However, you need to adjust it quite substantially. So there is trigger sessions that you can do in the gym. This is with rubber bands or body weight. Uh, the, the thing you have to really like make sure you, you manage is your intensity with that, like keeping it real low to moderate, uh, if, if any. And it, it's really just to like get that kind of pump to get blood flow so that way you're, you're able to kind of recover and heal uh, going into your next sort of foundational day where that's where you're doing all the work. Okay, so I'm going to give you some specifics, okay? Okay. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a week off. No lifting whatsoever. I don't care if you walk, hike, whatever. That's fine. But just take a complete week off. Don't change your diet. Still hit your protein targets. Then when you go back to the gym, follow MAPS Anabolic as it's laid out. Justin brought up the trigger sessions. Those are done on off days. So three days a week, you're, you're lifting. Three days a week, full body. Okay. On the days in between, you do what are called trigger sessions. You could do two or three of them in a day. Don't overdo those. It's literally, you're just getting a little pump. Yeah. Use use bands. little pump. Not just get a little pump. You're not trying to work yeah. out. You're just... You're just getting blood flow to target areas. That's it. That's that's on the off days. And then that's it. Follow that. And you're going to get strong. I would guess, uh, how tall are you? How much do you weigh? Uh, 190. So and I'm on the heavier side. How tall are you? 5'8". 5'8". Okay. Uh, I'm going to say your body weight might not change, but you're probably going to gain a good three, four pounds of lean body mass and lose three, four pounds of body fat. That's a That's a realistic, I would say, expectation for something like this, but you got to do exactly what I said. Take a week off first. Cause you're probably already past where you need to go. And don't fret getting shredded right now. Like right now, the goal should be get strong, build your metabolism. Yeah. So right now I want to get you in a place, get sleep, get recovery. Yeah. Right now I want to get you in a place where you are stronger than you've ever been. You are eating more than you've ever ate before. And we're, we're setting you up to get shredded after that. Got it. Yeah, thank you. I actually was thinking about taking one full week off because when I involuntarily have to take a week off, I always come back more developed, stronger. <laughs> yeah. That's always uh, the, sign. the sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're overtrained, man. You're overtrained. Yeah, like, even when like two days, I like my work is busy and I have to skip the gym two days. When I come back, my workout's actually amazing. And then, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I get like, oh, well, maybe I'll add this more thing and I'll work out extra hard no. the next day. And then I overtrain again. No. So just remember what we said when you, when you've been training like this for a really long time, like you have, and then we tell you to go down to three days a week, the, the challenge is going to be the mental challenge yeah. is you thinking you should do more. And like that more is going to, and more is not going to get you results. You got to follow it to a T trust, just trust us. Yeah. Got it. Um, and I guess have any of y'all done the eight by eight training or heard of it? Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm gonna so I'm like gonna assume that's eight German sets. Volume yeah, that's like a eight sets of the. Uh, of how many exercises? How many exercises a workout is that? Three. Yeah, and are these like, all compound lifts? No, not compound. Like, um, 
is usually like if you're doing chest and biceps on a day, you'll do three chest and like two biceps. Um, I first learned about it like off Steve Cook. He used to do a YouTube on it. He would do it once in a while. Hmm. Um, it's just really short breaks, like 30 second breaks. Yeah. So, you know, it's listen, it, it, there's some, I think some uh, factors in that that might have some value, but programming is much more than that. I mean, programming is, is actually quite complex. Um, and so if, like, like, like we said, follow maps anabolic as it's laid out. Don't worry about what you've been, it hasn't been working, right? So stop doing it. Take a week off, start maps anabolic and you'll get stronger by week two. Okay. So by week two, you're going to feel stronger and that's when you'll know. Yeah. Don't add more. Don't add more. You're going to want to add more. Don't add more. Follow it yeah. as it's laid out. Don't lift to failure. You're going to stop every set about two reps before you think you're going to fail. That's the intensity. And then watch what happens. You're not going to get very sore, but you're going to get stronger and you're going to build muscle. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. You got it, man. We'll send that over to you. Thank you. Yeah. This, uh, I, the first time I did this was, I don't know. I want to say late twenties. I had just read, uh, dinosaur training. And I was reading I old time, that. you know, like old time training techniques and how lifters lifted, a, you know, at the turn of the century. And I'd never tried really training that way. I'd never done it because it was always sold as like, this is what beginners do and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, ah. and I, I remember at this point, I was already in my late 20s. Like, what do I have to lose? I'm just going to give it a shot, see what happens. And I remember getting stronger by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Like by the end of the week, I was lifting more weight. And I said, oh, there's something to this. And then that was the beginning of the, the the transformation, how I programmed workouts and what I understood about. Yeah, it was it was mid 20s for me. And it was like the first time that I put like 10, 15 pounds on in a summer. It was fucking insane. That's mm -hmm. like, that's how much I was overtraining. I'm, I'm double days, basketball, doing all this stuff. And I yeah. literally just scaled way back. And again, the hardest thing for someone like this is the, the mental side. It's mm -hmm. not physically, it's easier. I mean, physically you're doing way less volume, way less intensity. So in your head, you go like, this can't be right because everything else in my life, the more I do, the more I put in, the more I get out, that doesn't work that way when it comes to training and nutrition. You just got to understand that finding the right balance is what's optimal. Next caller is Calvin from Portland. Calvin, what's happening? How can we help you? How's it going, guys? Uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I started listening to you guys around like COVID time uh, and I started chiropractic school during that time. You guys have like definitely helped me change kind of like my like view on like fitness, health, and how I want to communicate that to my patients. So just want to say thank you for that. Awesome. Uh, so I've been lifting for about three, four years consistently. And uh, since listening to you guys, I've always wanted to be able to hit a full squat, like full depth all the way down. Um, I can hit 90 right now and I stop. Uh, and I'd love to be part of like the squat and scroll club. I know that was a big thing a while back. So I'd love to be part of that. And so I really want to get there. Uh, but I'm having some trouble. I think it's my ankle mobility. Um, you know, I've done hip mobility religiously for the last year. I haven't really saw much progress in that. So I'd love some advice on kind of like your guys' um, you know, expertise and like how maybe I can help with my ankles and then also just also keep my chest up during a squat as well. Have yeah. you have you tried squatting down with your heels elevated to see if mm -hmm. that makes you go down lower? Yeah, that does make me go down lower. Okay. okay. Get yeah. your ankles yeah, down. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Key, here's the biggest key with mobility drills that I think one. Um, it, it takes a long time to make, uh, like a, a significant change in like range of motion. It's, this is not like a do it for a few weeks. And then I notice this huge difference. It's, it's a consistent working at it, working at it. And you're better off with, uh, more frequency than a shorter bout of like higher or longer intensity mobility drill. Meaning like some people are like, oh, I'm going to dedicate my off days, you know, of training two or three days a week to my, my mobility days. Well, you'd be way better off knowing that, okay, combat stretch is the major, like your ankle mobility is the major, major limiting factor in your squat. So you try and actually do the combat stretch like five times a day, every day, yeah. just for like two or three minutes. Like you don't, it doesn't need to be this big ordeal. It's like, you got a minute right now, get down on the ground real quick do combat stretch on each side and like doing it more often throughout the day, every day, just for a few minutes is going to get you, get you there faster than like, like an intense mobility hour session of, of all mobility work, you know, every other day or every few days. How often do you get to work out like barefoot? 
Uh, honestly, I haven't, I've gone like without shoes now squatting. So that's definitely helped. I feel like stability wise for my foot. I just feel like also like I just really have tight calves as well. So that probably contributes a little bit maybe to it as well. Mm. Yeah. You just got to practice mobility. Yeah. yeah. Just practice. And there's a lot of, I mean, do you have prime pro? Cause that's where we have all of our, uh, options for ankle mobility drills. Um, you know, there's some good ones. In the I area. don't have that. No. Okay. We got to get you, we got to get you that for sure. Cause then you're going to have some more options. Obviously, you know, Adam brought up combat stretch. That, that one kind of like covers the bases, but, um, to, you know, address anything else, uh, mobility wise with the ankles, like we have like toe squats in there. We have ones where we're actually like, um, pressing and holding in like a lacrosse ball in between as you're coming down, uh, to, uh, you know, really, really try to get some stability there around the ankles and get it to function properly. So there's go through that and then go through uh, and practice them as much as you can. By the way, we wrote that with what I, in my opinion, one of the best chiropractors I ever met in yep. my life. So that, that yeah, I, I know that you guys wrote some of the chiropractor too. So yeah, yeah. Dr. Brink is in there with us and I think he's one of the most uh, brilliant chiropractors that any of us have ever met. And so you'll get a chance to kind of see him. He's the one who demos and takes yeah. all of us through. Go through that, go through piano toes, go through all of that stuff, man. It's really about strengthening your feet and supporting around the ankle. Yeah. And, 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 and as you practice this and Adam hit the nail on the head, like do it often, practice it throughout the day, every single day. As you get better, go lighter with your squats. What you don't want to do is keep the same weight with the new range of motion because it's going to be, yeah, you're asking point. for trouble. So when you start to challenge your range of motion, I would cut the weight in half and slow down and pause at the bottom, pause mm -hmm. at the part where you're like, okay, this is as far as I can go, hold it down there, build strength in that bottom position. That'll help you out, but it's going to take a little while. It's going to take a little while. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Appreciate you guys' help. No problem. And then there was a second part to your question. Is that it? Uh, I just was curious too. I think I added this into my email as well, but just wanted to know, like, I know you guys had Steve Cook on the show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he kind of talked about how he was kind of going into chiropractic uh, before he went on the journey that he did. So I was just curious about like kind of your guys' like chiropractic experience, if you guys have any and like kind of what that like kind of encompasses as far as like whole health and functional medicine. I think there's a huge opportunity to be a good chiropractor. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of shitty ones. Just like there's a lot of shitty trainers and coaches and why I still think there's lots of opportunity in our space. There's a lot of opportunity in the chiropractic space. A lot of them are in the business of adjusting and having you come back forever. Right. And for uh, and that's why we fell in love with Dr. Brink was he was actually, for me, my first experience with a, a positive experience with the chiropractor. And I've worked with actually a lot of chiropractors uh, at my entire career as a trainer. And I got the same type of experience with every other chiropractor until I met him who was focused more on the quality of movement than he right. was with popping me and adjusting me and then sending me on my way to just come back and see him again next week. And he'd leave you with like homework and things yes. for you to do at home, which I think is like super valuable. And you gain a lot of trust from your patients that way. And also like eliminating the whole like 15 minute windows of like being able to uh, kind of get people in like a factory. So, uh, if you, if you're in at all different in your approach with chiropractic, I think you'll stand out like crazy. Yeah. At the end of the day, Calvin, it, this is the difference between the chiropractors that we've had great experiences with and those that we've had bad ones with the good ones alleviate pain, but then they look to solve the root cause of the dysfunction. Right. So good chiropractors are also movement specialists, bad chiropractors. They just know how to adjust. They're not movement specialists. They're not looking at improving uh, things like connection, mobility, and strength. It's all about, oh, here, this makes the pain go away. And then they'll say things like, stop squatting, stop deadlifting, don't overhead press anymore, whatever. A good, a good chiropractor will alleviate the pain, but then address why your body's moving in a way that causes that to happen in the first place. They're looking to solve the root cause. And it's, it's, it's night and day difference between those two that I, I just mentioned. So I would say for you, after you're done with your chiropractor school, or if you've already finished it, um, I would look at courses on movement, correctional exercise. That's where you're going to get, that's where you're going to separate yourself from your peers. Things like kin stretch. Kin stretch and yeah, correctional exercise, period, end of story. Stuff that physical therapists do uh, will help you a lot. Yeah, I got a pretty evidence-based school too. So we we preach like rehab and definitely finding the root of the problem and like kind of correcting it. So Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Good, Good deal, man. All right, we'll send you Maps Prime Pro. You're going to love it, especially with the field that you're in. Sweet. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. You got right, it, man. Right. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, so uh, Jordan Shallow explained it best on how adjustments work. So essentially, because you always wonder, like, how does an adjustment, because I could have my back yeah. could hurt. 
I could go get cracked and all of a sudden the pain is almost completely gone. Like, what did they do? So the subluxation <laughs> sort of a method? Yeah. So, I mean, just adjustments, right? And so basically what it is, is you have all these, you have joints and you have small muscles and connective tissue and things that hold those joints in place. And you're not, you're not able to really stretch them, remove them. It's not like a big joint where I can stretch my hamstring. It's different. So what they do with these uh, adjustments is they cause movement in those areas, release, because the CNS, for whatever reason, is causing those areas to be tight because it thinks it needs to protect itself. Mm -hmm. So the CNS relaxes. Oh, wow. The pain is gone. But then you have to take it a step further. Why is that happening? Why is my CNS think it needs to create that situation to, pr produ pr to provide stability? And it's because there's some kind of an imbalance or some kind of a movement issue. There's some kind of weakness yeah, lack of strength or there. tightness, and you need to address that root cause. But the adjustments themselves are not bad. They're great at alleviating pain, getting you to move again, but then you got to take it a step further. Now that we can move again, all right, let's fix the problem so this doesn't happen again. You know, something I didn't tell him that I think there's value in too is, you know, while you're addressing the ankle mobility uh, is allowing him to elevate the heels and still uh, squat really deep with lighter weight. Sure. So I think there's a lot of value just for the your hips and getting comfortable with moving weight with that kind of depth and then continuing to work on the ankle mobility. The only thing you just need to be cautious of is not allowing that to become this like crutch that it's like, oh, I'll just squat with squat shoes forever. But I did do that while I was working on my ankle mobility. I was continuing to squat and squat with depth. I would just use my squat shoes and then as I slowly progressed and got to a point where I could do it barefoot like that, um, I think there's some value in doing that too. Next caller is Max from Austria. Max, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for all the great content and advice you guys are giving. Um, it helped me a lot uh, to understand fitness topics. I highly appreciate it. Um, so I'm... Um, 23 years old and been going to the gym for three years now and calorie tracking moved me into a dangerous spot where I was around at around 6% body fat and this led to several health issues like low energy sleeping problems and for the past two months I've been bulking again currently at 3000 calories but I'm sort of noticing that I'm too food focused again through tracking I'm currently at around 150 pounds and I try to stick to 0.9 to 1.2 gram per pound of protein, 0.4 to 0.6 gram per pound of fat and the rest carbs. And this often leads me to making sort of a number game out of it where I constantly want to optimize everything to always hit my macros and also stay in these ratios. And I'm afraid to not track my food um, because I have to gain weight to be healthy again. And I just want the security that I'm eating um, enough and not dropping weight again. So my question is, if you guys could give me an advice how to track calories without overcomplicating everything, um, also not stressing mentally about it and get rid of my nutrition rules that I set myself and sort of use tracking as a tool that helps me to be healthy again. Yeah. So the way to do this, Max, is to back up and to make, give yourself much looser, less specific guidelines. I like just protein. Yeah. You're, you're getting into uh, a place where, uh, you know, a lot of fitness fanatics get into where we start to, I mean, we make something healthy, unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can move towards orthorexic type behaviors where everything has to be perfect. And the way to move out of that is to literally take your focus off of it. Okay, you literally have to take your focus off of it. Now, you're, th there's a complication here in that you need to gain weight. You've probably been ordered to gain weight. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sort of, because I was at like a really low body fat percentage and I have to gain weight now. Okay, so here's, here's one way you could do this, that you can um, kind of give yourself looser guidelines and, and, and maybe not get caught up in, in some of the specifics. H how many times a day are you eating right now? Um, around four to five times, um, depending if I'm at the gym or not. Okay. I would keep the meal frequency the same. And then here's your new rules. Okay. When you eat, make sure there's uh, a protein, make sure there's a vegetable, make sure there's some kind of a starch and that's it. Eat until you're satisfied and that's it. Don't count anything. Don't count 
Uh, protein don't count. Fat don't count. Carbs don't count. Calories. Eat until you're satisfied. What does that mean? That means you feel good, not stuffed like you can't breathe, but you feel good. Like, oh, okay, I'm really, really, I feel really good. And just follow that. Just keep that as your guideline and try not to. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to eyeball things and kind of say to yourself, oh, that looks like about 40 grams of protein. That's fine, but don't get caught up in it. Um, I also wouldn't weigh myself on the scale or pay attention to anything like that, except for maybe the, the weight that you move in the gym. If you're getting stronger, you're on the right track. That's where I put most of my focus, actually, is I shift the, you know, kind of neurotic behaviors around nutrition uh, over towards, you know, paying attention and, and tracking your your lifting, like paying attention to sets and reps and the weight and progressing and getting stronger through your workout and really just staying fed, Stay, staying fed so you feel satisfied calorie wise for your fueling your workouts. That's like now you're eating not for your body composition or for how you look, you're eating to perform better in the gym. And so me gauging my success of how I'm going right now is based off of me getting stronger in the gym. And if I feel like I'm not, oh, maybe I need to feed myself more yeah. and then feeding yourself more to fuel the workout. So switch your focus of aesthetics and body fat percentage and weight and stuff and focus it more on performance in the gym and what foods make you feel good when you work out. Like if I eat yeah. meal one and two before I lift, like, oh, wow, I noticed I got a great workout. Okay, you landed or something. Or, oh, wow, I noticed I was tired in this workout. Maybe I needed mm -hmm. to add a little bit more carbohydrates in there. So start thinking about your, your food as fuel to your workout and focus more like that. Yeah, I also um, often notice that I have a low appetite, especially when I'm stressed out. And therefore, I sometimes forget to eat or forget to eat enough. And that's why I started tracking again to make sure I'm eating enough because I also have a very active lifestyle, burn a lot of calories, go. Um, uh, I'm a lot outside, um, do other sports, and therefore, I'm also burning a lot of calories. Mm. So, like, like I said, I would keep the meal frequency. So, that's something that you could track. Oh, I got to make sure I eat at these times. Um, that's something that I would definitely maintain. Here's another thing too, 6% body fat. You need to gain weight. You got low appetite. Here's where I would tell somebody to throw in, uh, the occasional, like, I mean, literally like maybe you know, three or four days a week, uh, hyper palatable meal, you know, something you really enjoy eating. You like a burger and French fries. You like some pizza. That's okay to have, you know, maybe four or five days a week. Um, especially for someone like yourself who you tend to eat, want to eat less. Nothing wrong with that uh, whatsoever. But I would maintain the meal frequency. That's how you're going to keep yourself from under eating. Is if you if you if you track just I got to eat you know four times a day, yeah. or or whatever that meal frequency is that you're currently hitting, just maintain that, and then I think you'll be okay. What's the meal that you would tend to skip the most? Like is breakfast one that you're consistent with? No, I'm very consistent with breakfast. Okay. Um, I'm currently not skipping any meal, so um. You just, I really hit hit all my meals, even though I'm maybe um, not not hungry, but then I have to eat it again to get the calories in. Tell me about your activities that you're doing outside of of the gym. Like, what's your lifting routine? How many days a week are you lifting? And then what other what all what are these activities that you're saying you're doing a lot of? For four days a week of lifting, then um, cycling. I also like uh, running. Um, I'm getting like 10,000 steps minimum each day and, um, also like going, going on hikes, um, when it's sunny weather, you're doing too much. Yeah. Are you, so are you telling yourself you, you love doing all these things because of the results it gives you as far as leaning out and getting shredded, or do you just really love just doing all those stuff, all, all that stuff all the time? No, I'm a very active person and I just love doing sports. And actually, now I want to bulk again. I don't want to be shredded again. I want to bulk again. Well, then you got to cut back on all the cardio activity. I would and, cut back. and your lifting should be, if you're going to do that much activity outside of the gym, then your gym should only be, you should only be lifting one or two days a week. That's it. You'll and, get better results, by the way, this way. Yeah. You'll, if, you, if you bring your lifting down to two days a week, you're going to build muscle and strength. So, so in other words, Max, if you like the outdoor stuff, if that's what you really are passionate about, then I'd reduce the strength training. If you like the strength training, then I would reduce the outdoor stuff. But it then sounds to I me like it sounds to me like you like doing the outdoor stuff. 
No, I'm actually more into the strength training stuff. So then cut out the cycling, bro. Yeah. Cut out the cycling, right? especially if the goal right now is to build muscle and to gain weight. Yeah, yep. it's, it's, working, it's working against you. I would cut out the running and the cycling. You can do hiking and stuff like that, but no running, no cycling, maybe once a week, and that's about it. We're going to send MAPS Anabolic to you. You should be following a program yeah, like that also. Yeah, do, do MAPS Anabolic and a re, like cycle run maybe once a week max and uh, keep tracking or not tracking. Keep, uh, yeah, keep tracking the meal frequency be looser on your guidelines and you're going to start gaining weight. You'll start gaining muscle this way. Thank you so much, guys. You got it, man. All right, Max. Thanks for calling in. Okay. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. He was very excited with the, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> advice. I couldn't see his expression. I was like I open know. to. But, yeah. You know, um, yeah, I'm so much. glad you asked that, Adam. Yeah, way yeah. too much. Because I had a fight when he's like, yeah, I love to do all this stuff. And I'm like, hmm. Yeah, I know. Seems like someone's obsessing also about a lot of activity and movement all the yeah. time. Never less than 10,000 steps. I cycle. I run. Let me ask you guys a question. And I like the gym four times a Let week. me ask you guys a question. Yeah, it was an of, identity thing. Of all the people you've ever met and worked with, what percentage of them genuinely, genuinely enjoyed being that active, less all than one percent, bro. Yeah. That's why there's I, definitely people like that, but it's not. They common. tell themselves that. That's why exists. That's why I asked. I mean, it takes a lot of self awareness to admit this part because they. If you've, I mean, we're always closing ourselves, right, yeah. mm -hmm. on our own our own beliefs, you know. And so, you you tell yourself like, I love to run. I yeah, but do you really like? Do you really go into it? And it's like this very therapeutic Honestly, thing, or yeah. is it like this love hate yeah, no. punishment? I have even the therapy of it. It's kind of it's interesting because I would say like ninety percent are literally running from something, right? Literally, yeah. 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 That's it's that I think that's why the our messaging comes out that way sometimes where we're so passionate about that. Just because a very small percentage, and it doesn't mean that, that there is a percentage of people yeah. that have a very healthy relationship with it sure. and it's something they love to do. And I would never take that here's, out of their life. Here's a telltale way of knowing. Okay. When you meet somebody that genuinely loves to go out and be that active, they try to do the least amount of workouts in the gym yes. just to support them. That's you don't right. see them lifting five days a week and doing all this other no, stuff. No, you know what's a good example of this? My brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. He actually hates to work out in the gym. So it's probably one day a week. Yeah. yeah. And even that is like twisting his arm to get him just, I'm always like, dude, just lift once. Well, and yeah. he's an outdoor guy. So that's, it's like, that's what know, I mean. That, that it's, hand that's hand. when you know, like yeah. the guy is, he is, yeah. he, he is never inside his house. He doesn't yeah. watch any television. He's just all about the outdoors. Yeah. I have tendencies with that for sure too. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can tell. I mean, but quickly he was like, I like gym, the gym more. So it's like, oh man, then you you don't like the running and cycling as much as you think you do then. Yep. Right. You know? Look, if you like Mind Pump, and you want great fitness information, if you notice that the fitness industry puts out a lot of crap, check this out. Go to askmindpump.com. Ask it any fitness or health question. It's an AI model that will answer your question based on our episodes, okay? So it's coming from us, so you know it's true. Askmindpump.com. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 